Well, hey there, everybody. Welcome in to another episode of My Strange Bible. This time we're picking up with the conclusion to our riveting series on Judges chapter 9. Alex, how you doing, my friend? I am doing well, Steve. Uh, dealing with the throat issue, of course, because of uh, all of the pollen and stuff going around. But I'm feeling well, and I am excited to uh, finish up finish up this uh, series of judges. I think it's been a a great story that you've uh, introduced us to. Well, you sound great. You know, you kind of got Thank the you. Uh, the you know the the deep and scratchy thing going on. Like I'm, I'm, I find myself jealous more than anything, to be honest. I know I might have to go into a uh, some sort of narration and just hope that this is a continual um, allergy thing that continues to happen. Yeah, we've even had YouTube comments asking about why I sound like a girl and stuff, and I'm just like, you know, this is how <laughs> this is how God made me. So, um, like, I'm sorry, but not really. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I can't I, help it. I haven't had any uh, any uh, insults thrown at my way, fortunately, like that. But um, I think your voice is suitable for a lot of different things, uh, Steve. So, oh well, thanks. I suppose I'll take that as some sort of a compliment. Okay, so let's dive in. So, just to kind of catch you up, real quick, a brief review on where we are in Judges 9. So this is the story of Abimelech. The name means my father is king. This is Gideon's son, the son of his concubine. And he had roughly in the neighborhood of 70 brothers. He kills them all um, and turns the people of Shechem towards him and says, we're going to, I'm going to be your leader now. And one of the sons um, one of his brothers escaped Jotham and he pronounced this curse from the Mount of Blessing, actually, Mount Gerizim. And he, he pronounced this curse over <clears throat> Abimelech and the townspeople of Shechem. And he's basically like, hey, look, if you've done well, you've treated my father, Gideon, Jerubbabel, if you treated him well, then okay, like peace be with you and go on your way. But if you haven't, then you're going to be living under the um, influence of this bramble bush king, um, this faux king Abimelech, and you're going to essentially burn. And we'll find actually as we read through the story, as we finish it today, that that was quite um, prophetic in nature. Okay. So we started with the scourge of idolatry, talking about Gideon and um, how this passage is essentially a Canaanite text, even though it's Israelite. This is exactly what Israel would look like if they had descended into fully into Canaanite religion. <clears throat> the sin of selfish ambition was the second thing we looked at, and this is Abimelech taking on this ragtag group of guys and going out and killing his brothers. The solemn pronouncement was Jotham and actually pronouncing this curse from the Mount of Blessing um, onto the people of Shechem and Abimelech. Then last time we talked about the spirit of evil, which is uh, the idea that there's this actual, um, you know, spiritual being essentially that God sent to cause havoc in between the people, to cause a rift really in between the people of Shechem and Abimelech so that God could start redeeming this story for his glory. And we ended out last time talking about the sanctions of Shechem, which is basically um, one of the, the first things that happened when this uh, evil spirit began to cause a rift between them is the people of Shechem started robbing Abimelech's um, hired hands mm -hmm. whenever they were trying to travel back and forth into the uh, town. So that sort of catches us up where we are in this extremely weird, I mean, some scholars call this the strangest story in the Bible. And that's high praise because the Bible has some really strange stories. And so this has been a, a fascinating look uh, into a really dark point in Israel's history, I think. Um. All, all very true, and I, I think one thing that I would like to see is I'd like to see adopted um, the insult that we just uh, insult people by being calling them a bramble bush from now on. I'd love to see in like a presidential debate, um, just one of the uh, candidates call the other candidate. Well, you're just a bramble bush, and just uh, mm. see the look of confusion on on the other's face. I think that yeah. we should it should be a mainstream thing. 
Yeah, and and if you have it, that's that. It, I think that's a good idea. Um, if you aren't uh, familiar exactly with what we're talking about, well, you probably want to go back and check out last week's episode. <coughs> Um, or actually it's been two weeks actually since we recorded mm-hmm. one. So the last episode that we recorded a couple weeks ago, um, the, the long and short of it is, is that, uh, uh, Abimelech in this fable, this parable, if you will, that Jotham, um, you know, pronounces to the people, Abimelech takes the role of the Bramble King and talks about how, um, you know, the people will be in the shade under the Bramble King. And of course it's irony, dramatic irony in there and it's supposed to be hilarious because, a bramble bush can produce no shade. A, a bramble bush is actually good for nothing but burning. And yet these people have crowned this faux king who, um, you know, took 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 rulership by the by essentially, you know, number one through the sword and number mm-hmm. two through deception um, of, of his own family. And so this is not the way to uh, ascend to the throne in Israel. And as we'll see by the end of the story, God is very clear and very serious about that. And so if, um, you know, there are many kings of Israel who failed to live up to, um, uh, uh, of course, the, I think it's Deuteronomy 17, where it sort of like goes into extensive detail about the guidelines of a king. Like, what does a king of Israel need to look like? What is, what is the job description? What's the resume? What are the requirements? And um, most of the kings didn't end up ultimately meeting them, at least not consistently throughout their rulership. Um, but uh, I don't, I don't think uh, Abimelech. I don't. He, he probably didn't check any of the boxes, <laughs> and so this yes. was a king who was destined for a bad end. So, <laughs> yes, absolutely. Very good. So, uh, Alex, at this point, uh, we need to move further into the story. So we're going to look at, at uh, what I call the sedition of Gaal. So there's this guy in the story, Gaal. He's going to sort of enter the scene seemingly from out of nowhere. And so if you will read, Alex, um, from uh, verses 26 through 49, if you could do that. I know your voice is a little scratchy, so if you need me to take over at any point, you let me know. But otherwise, I'm going to let you take it away. 26 through 49. Through 49? Yep. This is my official demo now from with my new voice, so uh, Sweet. <laughs> I'll be sending this out to people. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Gael, son of Abed, came with his brothers and crossed into Shechem, and the citizens of Shechem trusted him. So they went out to the countryside and harvested grapes from their vineyards. They trampled the grapes and held a celebration. Then they went to the house of their god, and as they ate and drank, they cursed Abimelech. Gaal, son of Abed, said, Who is Abimelech, and who is Shechem, that we should serve him? Isn't he the son of Yerubal? Isn't Zibel his officer? You are to serve the men of Hamor, the father of Shechem. Why would we serve Abimelech? If only these people were in my power, I would remove Abimelech. So he said to Abimelech, Gather your army and come out. When Zebul, the ruler of the city, heard the words of Gaal, son of Abed, he was angry. So he secretly sent messengers to Abimelech, saying, Beware, Gaal, son of Abed, and his brothers have come to Shechem and are turning the city against you. Now tonight, you and the troops with you, come and wait in ambush in the countryside. Then get up early, and at sunrise attack the city. When he and the troops who are with him come out against you, do to him whatever you can. So Abimelech and all the troops with him got up at night and waited in ambush for for Shechem and four units. Gaal, son of Abed, went out and stood at the entrance of the city gate. Then Abimelech and the troops who were with him got up from their ambush. When Gaal saw the troops, he said to Zebul, Look, troops are coming down from the mountaintops. But Zebul said to him, The shadows of the mountains look like men to you. Then Gaal spoke again, Look, troops are coming down from the central part of the land, and one unit is coming from the direction of the diviner's oak. Zebul replied, What do you have to say now? You said, Who is Abimelech that we should serve him? Aren't these the troops you despise? Now go and fight them. So Gaal went out leading the citizens of Shechem and fought against Abimelech. But Abimelech pursued him, and Gaal fled before him. Numerous bodies were strewn as far as the entrance of the city gate. Abimelech stayed in Aruma, and Zebul drove Gaal and his brothers from Shechem. The next day, let when me, the people let me stop yeah. you there. So, yep. just to summarize what's happened so far, and then I'll let you read the the rest of this from forty two through forty nine. So, essentially, what's happening here is this dude named Gaal comes to town, and he's got some friends with him, 
And he's like getting thrown into this and like, what in the world is going on? So Gaal, son of Ebed, came with his brothers into Shechem, right? They went and they started just taking things over. They went to the countryside, harvested grapes from the vineyards. They had a celebration. So they're having this party. So they went to the house of their God and they went there and they started trash talking Abimelech, right? This folk king. Okay? Yeah. So these people come in from out of nowhere. Um, they hold this big party and start trash talking the, the king. And, and Gaal is like, wait a minute. Who is this fool? And why should we serve him? Um, this is the town of Shechem. And so you are to serve the men of Hamor, the father of Shechem. And so Hamor, he was a, uh, we don't know a lot about him. Uh, but essentially, he was the guy who founded the town of Shechem. Okay, that's what we know, right? He founded the city. And um, and so it's like, you're, you're to serve his man, um, not this Abimelech guy. And so he's like, well, if these men were in my power, I would just get rid of Abimelech. I, I mean, I'll just leave the people and, you know, forget that. So he goes to Abimelech and he's like... Go get your army together. Let's do this, right? Meet me in the meet me in the center of the town square, and we will hold a shootout kind of thing. And um, so, Zabul, um, this is the ruler of the city. He's basically like the governor in charge underneath of uh, Abimelech. We could call him Abimelech's chief of staff, you know, or something like that. Heard all this trash talk from Gaal, and he goes and tells um, uh, Abimelech about it. Right, and he's like, okay, so set an ambush because this guy's going to try to overthrow you, and I want you to be aware of it. Okay, so then he's a, he's a, he's a double agent, so he starts playing both sides. So then Zabul goes back to Gaal and he's and his man, and um, you know Gaal gets up in the morning and he says, look, um, um, let's see, where's that? So yeah, they, they get up early and at sunrise attack the city. Right, so he's he's telling he's telling Abimelech's men to attack the city at sunrise. Okay. So Gaal went out and stood at the entrance of the city gate, and Abimelech and them went out, and they got up from their ambush, and they were coming to attack. And when Gaal saw the troops, he said to the governor, he's like, look, troops are coming down from the mountaintops. What in the world is happening? And Zabul, the governor, he's like, oh, dude, <laughs> you're seeing things. You need to go back to bed. You had a little bit too much to drink last night, bro. Um, that is just the shadows of the mountains. It, they look like men to you. No big deal at all. And then Gaul, like, you know, adjusts his binoculars a little bit, so to speak. And he's like, no, I'm pretty sure that those are, that's an army. Like, I hear an army. I see an army. There are people coming. And, you know, Zabul at this point knows the gig is up. And he's like, ha, ha, ha. What do you have to say for your men now? You said, well, who's a like that we should serve him? <laughs> These are the people you despised. You wanted them to come out and fight. Now go fight them, right? So that's kind of where we're at. Um, in the story now. So they went out and apparently Abimelech pursued him and Gaal fled, right? So Gaal was all talk. Um, they get these guys out of there. Numerous bodies were strolling, it says, <laughs> as far as the entrance of the city gate. I, I just um, love that part. Numerous bodies. <laughs> right? It's, yeah, it's it's a really, really, it was a bloodbath, right? Mm -hmm. Basically, is is literally what happened here. It was an epic uh, bloodbath and uh, the sedition of Gaal um, did not ultimately uh, last very long. So I, I, I put this this next <clears throat> these next few verses sort of in the same category, even though Gaal was a little bit out of the scene, um, but really because it's it's a while before the next shift in the story. So if you want to finish out yep. verses forty two through forty nine, and then uh, we'll come in and we'll talk about some cool stuff. Yep, sounds good. The next day, when the people of Shechem went into the countryside, this was reported to Abimelech. He took the troops, divided them into three companies, and waited in ambush in the countryside. He looked, and the people were coming out of the city, so he arose against them and struck them down. Then Abimelech and the units that were with him rushed forward and took their stand at the entrance of the city gate. The other two units rushed against all who were in the countryside and struck them down. So Abimelech fought against the city that entire day, captured it, and killed the people who were in it. Then he tore down the city and sowed it with salt. When all the citizens of the Tower of Shechem heard, they entered the inner chamber of the Temple of Elbereth. Then it was reported to Abimelech that all the citizens of the Tower of Shechem had gathered. So Abimelech and all the troops who were with him went up to Mount Zalman. Abimelech took his axe in his hand and cut a branch from the trees. From the trees. He picked up the branch, put it on his shoulder, and said to the troops who were with him, Hurry and do what you have seen me do. Each of the troops also cut his own branch and followed Abimelech. 
they put the branches against the inner chamber and set it on fire. About a thousand men and women died, including all the men of the Tower of Shechem. Okay. All right. So here we have a really interesting chain of events. So, you know, we had this pronouncement from Jotham. And Jotham basically says that Shechem and Abimelech are going to go up in flames, right? That's basically the idea of Jotham's whole pronouncement. So we end up with this part, part of the story. By the time we get to verse 49, only half of this prophecy has come true, right? Mm. Uh, Shechem is up in flames. And the bramble that the people of Shechem hired as their king, Abimelech, um, seemingly is winning the day. Now, we'll see why that doesn't ultimately play out here in a little bit, but it is interesting to get this part of the story. You know, there's there's a literary, this is why I love the, looking at the Bible from a literary perspective, because there's, there's some tension, there's some conflict at play here. It's like, wait a minute, the guy who was supposed to get burned up by fire just like literally grabbed branches and burned up the tower of Shechem. And the city um, <clears throat> with these branches, right? Mm -hmm. And with fire. And so it says about a thousand men and women died. So I want to give you a couple things. So obviously there's like the sort of just the practical, okay, this is where we're at in the story. Again, not much to say here. Gaal and his men come to town. They get driven out. People are dying. The uh, conflict between... Abimelech and Shechem has grown to a point where they are, um, you know, I mean, the people of Shechem have now been destroyed. And so they have gotten their just desserts. So one half of, jo of God's uh, judgment on this situation is ultimately complete. And again, uh, you know, this is, this is the, back to the first, very first point, this is ultimately the scourge of idolatry. Hmm. Uh, again, right? Idolatry can only lead to destruction. That's, that's the practical sort of message uh, of the story. Now, there's a couple other things, though, because this is my strange Bible that uh, I wanted to talk about in here as I was researching this that I that I thought was was uh, was sort of interesting. So we see like this tower, right? Verses 40, 46 and, uh, you know, through 49 really talk about this tower of Shechem. And it says that they entered the inner chamber of the temple of El Berit, okay? And so this is another one of, you know, their gods, okay? Um, again, so this would be El, which is a generic word for God, and Berit is covenant, right? So this is the God of the covenant, similar to how earlier we saw Baal, Berit, and that would be the Lord of the covenant. Scholars are a little unsure if this is talking about the same exact spiritual being, Um or the, the you know the same spiritual entity that was being worshipped. They could be two different ones. They could be sort of the same one, um, being blended together. Um, so one of the things that's mentioned here is the plain of Aonim, um, or Oneim. Sorry, Oneim. I think is how you would say that. The diviner's oak again. The oak of the pillar. Same same sort of thing that we were talking about earlier with the. Um, um, like the same location with the uh, the oak of the what was it called earlier? The oak of something. The, uh, what was it called? I can't remember. Anyway, it's this oak tree, right? It's this, it's that same oak tree where the, the stuff was carried out earlier. So that's mentioned. And then we have this idea of this tower. So I, I got to reading this and asking the question, like, well, just what was this tower, right? So what do you think was happening there? There's this tower and there is the inner chamber of El Berit. What's happening there in this tower, in the inner chamber of El Berit? And I don't know if it would be historically accurate to say that <clears throat> this was a ziggurat. I don't think the tower of Shechem was necessarily a ziggurat. It was really large, and it was a almost like a military installation, if you will, of some kind. Like, it was, it was a, a really big place. But there was this inner chamber where... Uh, the god was worshipped, right? It was the temple of El Berit. This was idolatry um, in its purest and ugliest form. And 
again, what were they doing there? Were they simply just bowing to an inanimate object? Like if I were to bow to my light over here, you know, well, it's providing me light, right? It's got some sort of mystical quality. No, um, there was demonic worship happening, right? It was a real spiritual entity that was that they worshipped, and that was El Berit and and Baal Berit, right? That was their the the god of their new covenant. And so, this tower, among being, you know, yes, it was a military installation and other things, but it was also a place of worship for the demon, <laughs> you know, that they worshipped. Um, and and so this is again the logic of idolatry in the Old Testament. Worship of spiritual beings, well, in, in the New Testament too, frankly, worship of spiritual beings, which took up habitation in false idols. This is just how idolatry works. So really big mistake here that a lot of people make. Like, again, you'll just skip over a story like this. And if you never ask, well, what was the tower? Why did it have an inner temple for this being? You know, what were they doing there? Um, what was their worship like? It'd be kind of like saying... It'd be kind of like saying that we go to church and we um, we look at it. Let's say, what's what would be a good example of this? Let's say we go to church and instead of like, you know, let's say that there's a cross up on the stage. The cross is sort of the symbol of the, uh, you know, of the, of the resurrection. And let's say that we just worshiped the cross, right? We went there and we worshiped the cross. Well, wouldn't it be kind of strange to think that, like, we weren't thinking of something that was behind the cross, Mm. right? Wouldn't it be odd to just, like, worship to a a thing that we obviously fashioned with our own hand, right? This image, this icon, if you will. And so it's it's seeming or it's, it's similarly foolish to think that they were doing that, to think that they had these idols and these statues and that, I mean, they knew they forged these things with their own hands. They didn't just like plop into existence out of nothing, right? Mm-hmm. Um, they weren't a universe. Only universes appear to be able to be capable of that sort of thing, right? Um, so um, people knew they made these with their hands. And so it just doesn't even make sense to consider for even a moment that they weren't worshiping a spiritual reality beyond the actual idol, the carved or engraven image that we saw. And again, that is why idolatry has teeth. It's the only reason why the the concept of idolatry in the Bible has any teeth at all. Otherwise, you're simply comparing God versus an inanimate object. And of course, God is better than some inanimate object. God is above some inanimate object. The way that Dr. Heiser used to put it, well, God's above you and me. So like, mm. you know, um, we're, and, and we, we are above these inanimate objects, right? And so it's, it's not particularly special for God to be above them. You know, if you have consciousness, you are above them. Um, um, so we miss out on so much by not recognizing the spiritual reality uh, behind them. And what's interesting um, is how people will use the New Testament to uh, attempt to, you know, shake off or break free from what arises as sort of the obvious teaching uh, of the text. And so they'll use a verse like 1 Corinthians ten nineteen but forget to read verse 20. And so First uh, Corinthians 10, 19 says this. This is Paul, right, speaking to the church of Corinth. What say I then, that the idol is anything, or that which is offered and sacrificed to idols is anything? See, the idol is nothing, right? It's absolutely nothing. And then verse 20, but I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils. Mm. Or demons is another accurate translation of that word. Diamonos, I think, is the word. Okay, and not to God. I would not that you should have fellowship with devils. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> demons, right? So there it is. When someone, you sure it doesn't say um, fellowship and sacrifice to devils that don't exist? I'm quite positive that is not in the text. Okay, I'm quite positive. Okay, gotcha. Yes. And so, and so, but thanks for the, for the uh, layout. I just there. wanted to double check. Yes. Yeah. I mean, no, it's a good, it's, it, it's good. But so this is, li- this is literally 
Paul in two simple verses tying the logic of idolatry together for us. And by the way, I don't, I don't have it. Um, oh, I do. I do have it in my notes. It's literally the next verse. What Paul is doing is referencing back to an Old Testament concept, again, that you've probably never really considered, okay? So here's Deuteronomy 32, 17, backing Paul up. It says this, they sacrificed unto devils, not to God. Again, the word devils there, demons is the, is the word, okay? Demons is the correct word here. They sacrificed unto devils, not to God, to gods whom they knew not, to new gods that newly came up, whom your fathers feared not. Now, again, let's not be moderners when we read some of these words, to God whom they knew not. It doesn't mean that they didn't know who they were, okay? It means they didn't have a relationship with them, okay? Mm. That's the language that's being used there. That's how um, the, the biblical text is convey, conveying that kind of ideas, right? It's like, you know, got news for you. If the Bible says that Adam knew Eve, it's not talking about intellectually, okay? Right? There's, there's a deeper relationship going on there, something a lot more intimate. And so the Old Testament new uh, logic of idolatry, which the New Testament very accurately links onto, is this idea that the, um, the idol was a habitation only, right? It was a physical representation of the spiritual reality behind it. And now a logical question you might ask is, well, why did God not want any graven images or anything like that made. The reason is because God already made himself an image. And what is that image? It is you and me, right? Mm. Me and you are the image of God. How demeaning and how defacing, right? Think about this. Think about this. Think, think about Aaron, right? When Moses is up on the mountain, having a, you know, hashing it out with God, right? And Aaron's down there and the Israelites are freaking out. <laughs> <clears throat> right? And Aaron wants to just appease them. Okay? It's like me at soccer practice when they ask me a thousand times if they can do something. Yes. For heaven's sake, just <laughs> do it. Right? Okay? So Aaron wants to appease them. So he says, fine, throw in your jewelry, right? Let's melt it all down, melt all your gold, and we'll fashion us an idol. Here. Here. And he says, here, here are your gods who brought us out of Egypt. Okay? I submit to you that what he was doing there, and there are scholars who are divided on this, so I, I'm in good company, but then there's some who would disagree. But I submit to you what he was doing there is he wasn't trying to be a Canaanite, okay? That's not, that wasn't the idea. He wasn't saying, oh, this is a false god. What he was doing is, is he was trying <coughs> to create a physical representation. Because remember, you can, you can look on God, right? Remember, Israelite theology says that if you look at God, you die. So that's not a winning proposition, right? Mm. So they have nothing tangible to go on. And so Aaron's like, okay, we'll make us an idol here. Worship this. Here are your gods. And again, they knew that they made those idols, right? So they weren't thinking that they weren't looking at the golden calf and thinking, oh, this was our God. No, it was a, it was a place of habitation. It was something they could worship that spoke to the spiritual reality behind it. And imagine if you're God, right? Because they get in trouble for this. And God, God is literally like, Moses, they're down there making an idol and I'm going to kill him. I'm going to kill him. I'm going to kill him. And Moses is like, please don't. Please don't. Please don't. Have mercy. They just need a little help with this. They just came out of Egypt 400 years. Go a little easy <laughs> Their on brains okay, are a they, little screwy. Yeah, they don't exactly <clears throat> have all this figured out yet, right? It's basically the conversation between God and Moses. Um and, and so I submit to you that that's what was happening is they were trying to worship Yahweh in sort of like the, the only way that they really had a, had a category for how to do it. But it was still wrong because imagine this from God's point of view. From God's point of view, these beautiful human beings that you have made, right? So much better, far above and beyond any other image that any other God could possibly mm -hmm. want and hope for. We're the only image of God in creation, right? The plants aren't, the bulls and goats aren't, the sheep aren't. We are the image of God. We are beautiful. We have capacities that n nothing else has. And imagine watching that beautiful image that you make or, th or they, that you made not recognize what's going on and instead spend their handiwork and their time and their, and their thought and their energy and literally their gold, their finances, everything they had, all their resources building a lesser thing that they can point to when really the image was in them the entire time. So that's why, that's why idolatry matters. 
you know what it, <laughs> um, kind of makes it all the more preposterous is that um, the Bible clearly states that we're going to be um, rulers over um, the heavenly hosts, over angels, and yet the ones that we're going to be ruling over are the ones that they falsely worshipped. You know, beings that they're going to end up being ruling over one day are ones that they elevated to God's status, and it's just, yep. it's, it's, it's very <laughs> silly. <laughs> Isn't that wild and, and, mm-hmm. and ironic, right? And, Very and this ironic, is, yes. This is one reason why I am uh, such a huge proponent of, of the divine council worldview. Um, like, I refuse to believe that it's not true. Um, it just makes too much sense, right? And, and I, I have yet to see actually a good argument against it, especially when mm-hmm. you realize that it, 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 this just was the view of the church until the 300s AD, right? Uh, and, and again, this has all been documented. I recommend Tim Chafee's book, Fallen. Um, really documents this stuff uh, well and see ba- basically Augustine started to get creeped out by some of this fallen angel stuff and then by the time we get to the Reformation um, you know there had been a little sprinkles of, of thought against it but you know between there but then Luther and, and you know came out and was like adamantly against it Luther's like yeah this is just too weird like we can believe in a resurrection <laughs> but we're not we're not going with all this fallen angel stuff that's when the Sethite interpretation takes hold mm. and then you know Roughly the last, what, 400-ish years now of church history have been, um, you know, largely against the fallen angel interpretation. And I'm thankful to start seeing it uh, come back because it's I know the, the right one. I know this is a little off topic from the uh, a biblical passages, but it's just uh, so funny, the Sethite um, perspective where you maybe you can wiggle your way into making that apply to one part of the whole picture. But then how, how can you apply that to the dozens of other places in the Bible? Yeah. Or it just doesn't make sense. The logic breaks down very, very quickly. quickly. Very, very quickly. <laughs> yes. And if you if you just watch somebody, and I'll admit I'm not an expert. Like I, I couldn't, you know, if you asked me, hey, dismantle the Sethite interpretation right now. I mean, it would take me a minute. But there are some people who can basically rattle off in two minutes and just totally dismantle the, the mm. Sethite interpretation. I think uh, – there's, there's another perspective on that passage called the divinized kings passage. It's basically like you know these were, um, yeah. these were great mighty kingly warriors who were, you know, uh, who took these women as wives and whatever. Like there's some people who argue for that. Actually, some very smart people argue for that. And I'm just like, bro, that ain't it. That's just not there. You know, when it, the if you understand the backdrop of the text, it's almost impossible to to, mm. to legitimately come away with that view, in my opinion. Um, yep. But so. So, right, so so the idea behind idolatry being ultimately that the problem with it is the reason why it's not cool is that we're the image of God and we're so mm. much better than these other images. And, of course, there's more to it. Like, obviously, you're trading your worship and you're worshiping a fallen angel, essentially, a lesser God um, instead of the, the one true God, Yahweh, um, who, is the, who is the creator. So um, here's another question that sort of comes up in this discussion. Have you ever wondered why there are no demons in the Old Testament? Right? So this is kind of a weird thing. Jesus just shows up and starts randomly casting out demons in the New Testament, right? This is a very well-known motif of the of the life of Jesus. But you've never witnessed this before now in the Old Testament, right? You, you're never really encountering these demons other than, you know, in verses like Deuteronomy 32 that don't really make sense because you don't have a divine council worldview where it says they sacrificed to devils. Wait a minute, I thought they sacrificed to idols, but this is they sacrificed to devils. Well, the answer is mm. yes, they did both. both. And it was one of, one of the same, right? And so the, the way that I put this is that the answer is, well, there are demons in the Old Testament. You just thought they were fake, right? You mm. thought they were fake. You thought they were gold and wood and, and, and you know, idols. And um, again, because of the logic of idolatry and how that works, they're not. So the difference, and I, I thought about this, uh, how, you know, what's, what's the right way What's the right way to to put this? And this is how this is how I think is the right way to think about it. The difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament when it comes to essentially demonology is a strategy change, right? A strategy change. So instead of now taking up habitation in the images of other gods, right? So instead of these instead of these um, demons taking up habitations in you know the philistine god dagon or um 
you know, the Asherahs or the, or the Baals, right, and being worshipped in these ways. Instead of that, they needed a strategy change. And so they started uh, taking up habitation in Yahweh's images, Yahweh's imagers, right, in, mm. in, his, in his people, right? So they start, what they started doing was they realized, oh, we don't need to inhabit these you know, these idols anymore, which of course they still did in some cases, right? Because there were, you know, literally like some of the early church arguments were like about meat that had been sacrificed to idols, right? So obviously there was still idolatry and idol worship going on there, okay? Um, but what they did was they started taking up habitation because they realized that they could infest people, mm. right? And so Jesus is not having any of this, right? Jesus comes and he is interacting with them. And he's casting these demons out of them because they don't belong in his image. Why else is he, what, 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 what is the purpose? Why else, right? They don't, they need to get out because they are now trying to take up his property, right? They're trying to take over his image. And he says, no, that's not gonna work. <laughs> so hmm. you gotta get out of here, right? And, and again, they recognize him, right? Who are you, you know, have you come, uh, why are you in the Legion, right? Talking to, 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 to Jesus. They're like, you know, why are you here now? How, you, you've come before the time, right? And I don't, I'm not going to pretend to know exactly what was meant by that. Like, did they know the battle plan? Well, I don't, I don't think they did. Um, but regardless, um, you know, there's this idea that, yeah, like they recognize who this guy is and it's because, you know, in some weird way they're related, <laughs> right? Right. These are, these are demons. These are essentially disembodied spiritual beings that once were the fallen angels, right? The fallen sons of God. That's kind of what, if you look at ancient um, uh, Second Temple Jewish literature, it actually makes this connection. Um, it makes this connection that essentially the demons that you find in the New Testament are the in, the disembodied spirits of the dead Nephilim giants that were <clears throat> killed in the flood. And boy, I know that's weird. But it's in the literature, right? And so mm -hmm. you can you can find it and go read it for yourself. Okay, so um, I know this was a little bit of a, uh, a detour here on the on the sort of the demonology stuff, but I, I figured our audience would um, would appreciate it, and I think it's important to understand why what they were doing was so bad. Like like like, what does it mean to be fully entrenched in in Canaanite religion? Well, it means to trade your covenant God for another covenant God when the irony is is that the covenant God that you could have had is the one who you know put himself in some sense in you mm -hmm. instead of you worshiping some other lesser being who will let you get away with sin but can't offer you anything beyond that momentary pleasure and so that's what was happening and that's why it's so bad and that's why the the trade is not worth it um, anything else to say about that before I want to read one more thing on this point, then we're going to move on to the next one. No, go ahead and continue. That's fine. Cool. All right. So, um, I always think this is interesting because as interested in, as I am in sort of the uh, nerd theology stuff, I'm also interested in, in apologetics. And so I always like finding out when there's, you know, um, sort of secondary confirmation for some of the stuff we saw. So I'm going to read this. Um, this is an excerpt from Bryant Woods from Ramsey's to Shiloh, um, and I thought this was interesting. Quote, a large fortress or Migdal temple discovered on the Acropolis of Shechem has been identified as the temple of Judges 9. It was constructed in the 17th century BC and lasted into the destruction of the city by Abimelech in the 12th century BC. The largest temple yet found in Canaan. It measures um, 21.6 by 26.3 something it's, it has an m there but i don't really know what that means i confess i, I don't know it's a lowercase m i mean i, is I don't it, is that is it meters is it meters that seems how long's a meter i don't know i'm, uh, I'm showing a my meter is now. roughly three feet it's a little bit roughly different feet than that. okay yeah right okay so 21 it's probably about right yeah it has foundations 5.1 meters thick that supported a multi-story superstructure of mud bricks and timber. Okay, so on the east, two towers containing stairwells to the upper stories flanked the entrance. Inside, two rows of columns, three in each row, divided the space into a nave and two side aisles. Close quote. So, um, yeah, just cool, just interesting that this actual tower uh, has been found and identified. And just another reminder that, um, again, we're, we're reading ancient words that were written 
by real ancient people about real activities that happened in real time and space. And um, I, I think because we often live in a culture where you can just sort of memory whole things and change the past, it's always uh, fascinating to, to see sort of that external evidence for, for the things that we find in the Bible. Yeah, um, it's. <laughs> I always like when uh, when they when just the measurements are involved with it. I I don't know why I'm kind of um, maybe like you. I just like to get the details too. Kind of like nerd out a little bit on the dimensions of it. Like I think about um, um, like the Ark of the Covenant and the Tabernacle and how and just the the measurements and dimensions of it. So much time is spent just oh, yeah. talking about things like that. So. Um, I know that's uh -huh. not directly from uh, from the Bible that you just read, but it's just uh, I just like learning about that stuff too. It gives it just uh, yeah. some pretty good context on the size and scope of of what things were like then. Yeah, well, it just kind of also you know goes back to the reality of it, the significance of it. I mean, like yep. everything in the um, you know the even the dimensions and the design of the tabernacle and, and the temple, it was all intentional, right? Mm -hmm. um, nothing, nothing left to chance, nothing by accident. And uh, the more you dig into that stuff, it's like it can seem really a little terse to start with, but like there's really cool realities behind it, you mm. know, once you dig into it. So, um, okay. So, hey, if you will, uh, go ahead and read for me verses 50 through 57 to close out the chapter. Yes. Yeah, so, Abimelech went to Thebes, camped against it, and captured it. There was a strong tower inside the city, and all the men, women, and citizens of the city fled there. They locked themselves in and went up to the roof of the tower. When Abimelech came to attack the tower, he approached its entrance to set it on fire. But a woman threw the upper portion of a millstone on Abimelech's head and fractured his skull. He quickly called his armor bearer and said to him, Draw your sword and kill me, or they'll say about me, a woman killed me. So his armor bearer ran him through and he died. When the Israelites saw that Abimelech was dead, they all went home. <laughs> in this way, God brought back Abimelech's evil the evil that Abimelech had done to his father when he killed his 70 brothers. God also brought back to the men of Shechem all their evil. So the curse of Jotham, son of Yerubal, came upon them. Nice. You know, I, I just love verses 56 and 57 there, right? Yeah. I, I love how... It's so good. Like, you could have stopped reading, right, at verse 55. Yep. And it would have the point would have been there, but then you would have had to like connect a few dots, right? This but says the, the text, point. <laughs> mm, yeah, this brings it back around. And so this is kind of a fascinating thing. Like even though, even the markers of the text and all the things that we've discussed in the past couple episodes, even though it, it talks about how this is basically what the text would look like if Israel had descended into Canaanite theology. Again, you still, you this helps us understand that it was, the story was being told a particular way for literary <laughs> effect. Hmm. Right, it's um, because it clearly Yahweh, even though he's not called by his covenant name Yahweh in this passage, clearly Yahweh is still the hero of this story. Mm -hmm. The idea is that God brought back Abimelech's evil upon him. He brought back Shechem's evil upon them, and specifically the curse of Jotham came upon both Abimelech and the men of Shechem. And, and the narrator is very clear, <clears throat> such as to leave no doubt that God has been in control this entire time, even through the arguably the darkest period of Israelite history that spanned, you know, a little over three years of time. And that's a long time if you're living mm -hmm. right in the middle yeah. of this. So, so what's going on here? All right, so, you know, at verse 49. Can I say something I mean, first? Oh, please, yes. I, I, um, you and I like to see where Steve and I message each other quite often about our devotions reading, just funny stuff that we we see. I feel like this whole last section is 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 hilarious where you see the downfall of a boom, like there's obviously a serious message to it, but then it's almost like a Monty Python version in the Bible. Like, I feel like a skit could be acted out here where Abimelech's approaching the tower and he gets his head fractured by a millstone being thrown and, and hitting his head. A woman does it, and rather than try to recover or rather than focus on the wound, he just says, ah, I don't want a woman to get me. Quick, stab me. And it's, uh, I don't know, it's just a very funny scene, I think, that that is his concern in all of this. His death is upon him, and he doesn't want his name to be known that a woman slayed him. <laughs> right, yes, yes. Well, and it's, you know, I mean, it makes sense, right? There is the, um, there is the honor 
part mm-hmm. of it, right? This is yep. an honor shame culture, right? And so, yeah, sure. this, it would have been very bad for him to have died by the hand of a woman for his legacy, right? To yep. to have meant anything. Um, since you went there right now, I'll go ahead and just bring out this point that this was a point that I was I was going to mention. I, again, I think it's fascinating how this woman crushes his skull with a rock. And there's another passage um, in um, Judges earlier. Is it Judges 4? I think it's Judges 4, <coughs> where um, you've got this army commander, Sisera, and um, at the end of the story, um, Yael is the wife of um, some random guy, a um, military you know, soldier, and uh, he, you know, uh, Sisera ends up going into the tent. He's escaping and fleeing from a battle, mm. and he goes into this tent with this woman. And he's like, "Give me some water," and she's like, "I'll do you one better, baby. I'll give you some. Wa- I'll give you some warm milk, you know." And so she gives him some warm. And it would have literally been like it says milk, but it's, it would have literally been like a um, um, almost like a yogurt, like a really like a soothing sort of agent, okay? And so that uh, he relax, come on in, have some milk, you know, kind of thing. Bam, right, drives a tent peg through his skull. <laughs> right through his skull. Oh my god. And so and so here so it, it's interesting, right? So this is another sort of example where, okay, you've got a woman crushing the skull, mm. okay, of 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 the snaky figure in the passage right um and so in this case instead of the seed of the woman crushing the head of the serpent the woman herself right directly crushes Mm -hmm. the head of the serpent right of the one who's deserving of the punishment and what i think is interesting about this is this is literally the story of what happens if satan wins right this whole story like Mm. if satan wins then this story is what happens and what i think is fascinating is that abimelech's conspiracy depended on the support of his mother and her family so he killed so again picture he goes to his mom a a woman right a female he goes to his his mom and her family relies on them then he literally (laughs) decapitates all of his brothers against a rock and and then at the end of the story he's killed by a woman, <clears throat> arguably a mother, right? Very likely a mother, right? So he goes to his mother for support, kills his brother on a rock. End of the story, he's killed by a woman, probably a mother, with a rock, right? Mm-hmm. I, I, one guy, I, I heard you know, a message on this as I was preparing for the original sermon. And one guy, he used this terminology, and I was like, oh, that's, that's like, it's so vivid. He said, honestly, like, this whole process is just like, slow and brutal fairness mm. <laughs> right mm. is, yes is is what's ultimately without the mercy of god in a situation what you have is just slow and brutal fairness like really what god did for us is unfair right it's it's, it's unfair to him that he had to go through that that he had to be the sacrifice that he had to take our place right but he did and that's why we have grace right that's why it's beyond simple mercy it's the other it's the other side of things where it's also grace right so we're not given what we deserve we're given what we don't Mm -hmm. deserve right and and the end otherwise is just just this slow and brutal fairness so i always think it is fascinating um to see the gospel work out in these in these stories so like I said it like this. This story is a microcosmic demonstration of what happens in a life without Jesus, right? We're born into corruption. We're sent into a downward spiral of sin. We're accused and confused by demonic forces. We're judged with the same measure that we judge others, but for grace, right? Like, Mm -hmm. were it not for the grace of God, that is the slow and brutal fairness that we would experience. There's this song... It says, um, were it not for grace, I don't know where I'd be. Wandering down some pointless road to nowhere, right? My salvation left up to me. <clears throat> and I, I love that line, the pointless road to nowhere, right? That's the road Abimelech was walking, right? Mm. Abimelech was walking the pointless road to nowhere where, yeah, you can get away with sin, 
for a season on that road. You can have some of those ambitions come to fruition. You can you can have a, a time and a season of pleasure. But ultimately, you're going to be judged by God with that slow and brutal fairness. So again, <clears throat> verse 49, Abimelech's feeling pretty good. He's doing what kings do, right? He's like, well, yeah, I've already taken Shechem. This is going to work out great. Let's move on to the next town. So they go to Thebes. Right, yeah. and then he so he's going to go conquer Thebes, and of course, Thebes is where he meets his demise because well, ultimately you reap what you sow. <laughs> well, think about that too. Um, what you were saying is you're kind of going on your own like means of salvation when you when you reject God. So, think about Abimelech where he killed his his brothers, assumed the throne, took over, and now he's in this position of power. And it still like wasn't enough. And I know like conquest and you know being a ruler and trying to make any of yourself was big um, in those days. Still is big now for a lot of world rulers. But he just wanted more, and there was no satisfaction to the amount that he wanted to rule, the people he wanted to conquer. And if this would have, if he would have passed this one, and if he wouldn't have died here, he just would have wanted more and then more and more. And there would have been nothing to satiate that um, yeah. desire for him. That's exactly right. The only way to find final rest and, and satisfaction is to realize that you can never bring the final rest and satisfaction and to yeah, rely on getting that from somebody else, right? Mm -hmm. And the only person capable in human history of producing it is is Christ. Mm -hmm. and, and so I, I subtitled this series, if you remember back to our first episode, God Will Not Be Mocked. And we, what we talked about, if you remember, is this idea that I've always thought it was like just like, again one of these strange sayings like God will not be mocked like I know what mock means kind of I think but like what does that mean and we talked about how it means um, the the word the Greek word um, mikterizo it literally is indicative of the action of turning up your nose right turning mm -hmm. one's nose up and I I was like okay well I kind of get that but like I don't really know exactly what that means like if I were to uh, try to define what that gets across I don't really know so I looked it up in Webster's right and it's like. To refuse to take or accept something because it is not good enough. And so mm. the end of the story brings it all the way back to this theme of like, God will not be mocked, right? God is, God, like what they've tried to do in this in this story, this passage of scripture, was trade God, trade Yahweh for another covenant God. And God said, oh, no, 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 no. I will not be mocked. In other words, he's not better than that god is not better than me and the bible says by the way that he's a jealous god right yeah. what is, what is meant by that well what's meant by that is that god understands that he is the creator and so it is literally ludicrous it's, it's fundamentally insane which is why the bible says that the fool said in his heart there is no god it's literally defining the word fool for you uh because if it, it's fundamentally insane to deny that the creator god is worthy of all worship and that and that that loyalty should be traded to some other god, right? And so God says, "Look, I'm not going to be mocked. Um, you don't get to say that I'm not good enough because I am good enough, and God will use whatever means necessary that He needs to to show you that He is good enough. And unfortunately, He's a good and merciful and gracious God. And so the way that He ultimately did this was by punishing His His Son Jesus Christ on the cross and drawing His blood in our place." And of course, if you know Christian Trinitarian theology, it's basically God crucifying himself, right? The Bible, uh, the way it puts it is like that, that Jesus says that he can lay himself down and rise himself back up, right? And so um, this was something that he ultimately took upon himself. And sort of the practical point there that I love <coughs> is just that um, you're all, like, if you're a Christian, if you're on God's side, you're on the right side, even when and if it doesn't look like you're winning. Mm. Um. I'm so fascinated by, and we don't really get into like the politically correct stuff much on, on this podcast, but like I've been listening to a lot of Joe Rogan recently and um, granted, I don't, I don't listen to like everything. Like I don't, when he talks to like comedians and stuff, I don't do that. But like when, when there's people who are talking about culturally important things, I'll, I'll listen. And it's, you know, I mean, talk about somebody who just wishes that he could just be a leftist, but like, this is a guy who used to like, you know, totally denigrate the idea of Christianity. I mean, like mm. Christianity was for fools a few years ago from his mouth. And now, like, I mean, he said it jokingly, but not like the other day on his podcast. He's like, we need Jesus, bro. Like for real, like it's getting bad. And ultimately all that's happening is Joe is seeing the fruits of what happens when mm. you ultimately 
live under the judgment and wrath of God. I mean, we find in Romans 1 and all these different places that a lot of what we're seeing today, again, even when you look at homosexuality and transgenderism and stuff like that, like these things are mentioned in the Bible and they're mentioned in the context of judgment from God from a nation that's gone astray, right? And, and so like, it's not surprising that we see this stuff and Joe's right. Like we literally need Jesus. And so sometimes it doesn't feel like we're winning, but if you're on God's side, you're always winning, right? And so even if you're three years under the hand of Abimelech and Shechem has been turned upside down, um, Thebes is coming, right? And ultimately, the head of the serpent will be crushed in due time, which is God's time, right? So that's the practical point. And if I if I could, and I'll let you come back with anything you want to here, but kind of to, to wrap up um, some of my thoughts, I, I want to read this from Daniel Block, um, Bible scholar. This is from his book on Judges and Ruth. Quote, Abimelech has craved desperately to prove himself a worthy successor to his father by living up to one interpretation of his name. The king, Gideon, is my father, only to experience the original intention of the name. The king, divine, is my father. Neither human pretension nor human ferocity could dislodge Yahweh from his throne. I love that line. Neither human pretension nor human ferocity could dislodge Yahweh from his throne. In the end, Abimelech's uh, egomaniacal ambition must yield to the kingship of God. And with the story of Gideon is, oh, oh, excuse me. And with this, the story of Gideon is complete, end quote. Mm. Really fascinating, really fascinating story. Yeah. Um, no, I, I agree. It, actually, the only thing that I really have, because we've kind of talked about it at length, I, I actually just have a, a, a question. Does um, Jothan ever come back into the picture again, or is this the only time he's mentioned? I think this is the only time. Pretty crazy. Something that I have to think about more. It's just a really, what a really cool character, <laughs> you know? Coming right? into the yeah. story, pronounces this kind of... Uh, judgment if you will upon abimelech and then just leaves um yeah it's very yeah very interesting yeah so again in this whole story there's this contrast between the bramble king and the paradise king right and, and really the, the the question for you the listener is which king are you going to serve right do you want the oppressive relentless king or do you want the merciful and gracious king who loves you so much that instead of putting himself on a pedestal he actually lowered himself and sacrificed himself. Hmm. And so like the three practical points that I told you to keep in mind at the beginning, I'll just bring them back around. Number one, idolatry is the root of all sin. Realize that first, right? If you have a sin issue, you ultimately have an idolatry issue. Two, selfish ambition leads to destruction, right? Are you building your kingdom? Or are you building God's kingdom? And then number three, the, the only real rescue is the work of Christ. And so... um. If you remember, I opened up this whole thing with an excerpt from Blaine Eldridge's book, The Paradise King. And I told you that I wanted to read sort of the ending of that um, as, as well. And so we left off with this idea that there was no king in Israel and things were really dark. And then we kind of went into that story uh, of the judges. Um, and again, the way I really wanted to frame this is, is to realize that this is another bottleneck was what I call them in scripture, where like, were it not for the greater plan of God and the grace of God, the story of Israel stops. And if the story of Israel stops, yours and my story stops, right? This is Israel being dis dissolved into Canaanite religion. But thank God, he had a plan that goes beyond that. So yeah. I'd like to read this little excerpt here, and then uh, we can give concluding thoughts and wrap up, okay? Quote, but the Lord had a solution in mind. From ancient times, it had been prepared. Thank God for it. In Moab, far from the sea, two women crossed the stricken ground, Naomi from Bethlehem and Ruth, a Moabite. Ruth was loyal, stout-hearted as Moses, and she found shelter in the virtue of an old man named Boaz. Boaz was descended from Perez, who was born to Judah by Tamar. Boaz was faithful, and his men wore swords in the field. In that dark time, he married Ruth. With law lawlessness on all sides, they were wed. And so it happened that Boaz <coughs> from Bethlehem fathered Obed. Obed, it is well known, fathered Jesse. Jesse of the line of Judah fathered David. And that's the end of the quote. 
But there's one connection in there that I think uh, Blaine failed to make, probably for the sake of time, that is something that should not be ignored. And that that is the fact that Boaz was the son of, of a young lady by the name, I, I believe she was the direct descendant or he was the direct descendant. Um, I'll have to double check that now, but um, I believe Boaz was the son of Rahab, the essentially Canaanite um, mm -hmm. who aided the Israelites, uh, aided the two spies in the city of Jericho. And so what that tells me I mean, think about that. Think about how Christ, David and then Christ, are like directly descended from and in the line of, of this Canaanite prostitute who had been integrated into Israelite society. And so it's really interesting that I, I think it shows, if you will, I mean, preachers have made this point, the scarlet thread, you know, the running all through history, kind of a play on words of... Um, you know, the, the scarlet thread that Rahab hung out of her window over the wall of, of, uh, of walls of Jericho. <clears throat> but what I want to make the connection here is that it's out of this sort of Canaanite debauchery that we've been talking about that the redemption story ultimately comes through, right? Mm -hmm. And how cool is that? That Christ has the ability to save all and redeem all because he's our brother, right? He is related to all of us in that way. And and he can he can draw redemption right out of the line of this great evil that was being committed. And that's exactly what he did ultimately when Boaz married Ruth. So Boaz um, coming through the line of, like it, it, what it shows is that, um, you know, Christ is able to redeem because he is our brother. Right, and so it's 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 out of this Canaanite even debauchery that the line of Christ, like the 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 line of the Messianic King of David, uh, comes through to redeem each and every one of us. And so, again, he he came as the lowest of the low to save the lowest of the low. Mm. And I think that's a point that it's it's really cool and it helps authenticate the biblical storyline to me to show. Um, I mean. They didn't have to portray Christ as, as coming down, you know, through the line of this Canaanite prostitute. And yet there it is. It's it's literally mentioned in the genealogy of Jesus. Yeah, so, really cool. Really wild. Really wild. The Bible is really cool. <laughs> and strange. And strange. So that's it. I mean, I've drawn out a little bit here at the end, um, really trying to hammer these points in uh, to, to bring the practical together with the nerdy. But that's it. This has been a three-part series on this weird story. Judges 9, and um, I hope you learned something. I think this is actually going to be one that I read um, occasionally and just skip ahead to or go back to and just read. It's a really, because it's not an extremely long one. It's not reading a whole book of the Bible. It's a, a chapter, chapter and a half, and uh, just really gives you, it's just a great story to learn some lessons and kind of see some darkness involved, and then uh, um, ultimately God's uh, justice in the end. Yeah, 1,000%. Um, God always wins on the in, in the end, and I'm excited that I'm on the right team. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, well, that's going to be a wrap on this one. So if you're finding this podcast helpful, share it with others, tell a friend, leave a comment on YouTube, uh, leave a review if you would on the podcast app to let other people know that you like it. That actually would help us out mm, quite a bit. 100%. Um, and uh, to, to you make sure people who uh, you know find the audio podcast know that it's one that's worth checking out. So please consider doing that, and uh, thanks. Thanks you for the uh, the three-part series, Steve. Much appreciated. Looking forward to many more. Amen.